so much for tuning in uh, to tonight's program. Uh, my name is Pat Kane, Public Programs and Visitor Services Coordinator at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. And we are here tonight for an excellent virtual program uh, titled A Whole Nother Ball Game, Baseball in Central Illinois from the 1860s to the 1970s. And in just a few short moments, um, I'm gonna welcome on uh, Barbara Olschlager Garvey, um, our Museum and Education Department Director at the Champaign County Forest Preserve District to, pre to present tonight's awesome program. But before we get there, I just wanna go over a few logistical things, um, some housekeeping items, I'll let you know about what else is coming up uh, at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Uh, first, uh, if you could, let us know where you're watching from tonight uh, by writing down in the comment section below uh, where you're tuning in from tonight uh, for tonight's virtual program. Have a few folks doing that already. Uh, Susie's tuning in from Muhammad, right where the museum is located in Muhammad, Illinois. And Kathleen is tuning in from Canton. So thank you, Susie and Kathleen, for letting us know where you're watching from. But we always love to know where folks are, are viewing our programs from. So uh, feel free, if you're comfortable, uh, to write where you're watching from down in the comments section. Um, also, uh, a little bit about us, uh, Museum of the Grand Prairie, um, uh, our, our current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County in East Central Illinois. Uh, we've been open, um, opened originally in 1968 as the Early American Museum, and we are a part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, um, a collection of uh, seven forest preserves in Champaign County, as well as two educational facilities, including our museum at Lake of the Woods Forest Preserve in Muhammad, Museum of Grand Prairie, and the Homer Lake Interpretive Center at Homer Lake Forest Preserve near Homer, Illinois. Uh, also, uh, we do want to hear from you. Um, uh, you know, want to get your thoughts on tonight's program. So after tonight's program, if you wouldn't mind, uh, uh, please complete this simple survey that I'm dropping into the comments right now. This short, simple survey should take you no more than five-ish minutes uh, to complete, but it'll help us improve our future programs and program off offerings. Let us know what you thought of tonight's program, uh, what other programs you may be interested um, in the museum and the Forest Preserve District providing. Again, it should only take a few minutes and we would thank you so much uh, uh, for actually filling out that survey. A few other programs coming up in the near future. Um, on Thursday, September 2nd, so a week from tonight, our friends over at the Homer Lake Interpretive Center are gonna put on another online event um, uh, via Zoom uh, titled Mosquitoes in East Central Illinois. Uh, Holly Tootin, who is a veterinary ecologist with the Illinois Natural History Survey Medical Entomology Lab, is going to present this program, um, and re registration is required for that program. So visit uh, ccfpd.org, the Champaign County Forest Preserve District website, to learn how to register for that program. Again, Thursday, September 2nd, from 7 to 8 p.m., this program titled Mosquitoes in East Central Illinois is going to be a virtual program that you do need to register for as it will take place on Zoom. So be sure to register so you can get that Zoom information. On Saturday, September 11th, we're gonna put on our annual Prairie Stories event um, where we provide a number of different demonstrations and activities to help bring, bring 19th century uh, uh, East Central Illinois uh, history uh, to life. We'll have local blacksmiths, um, uh, uh, schoolhouse lessons, butter churning, candle dipping, and so much more um, uh, at this uh, event. All current public health guidelines will be followed. Uh, all, all demonstrations and activities will take place outdoors um, in the interest of keeping our patrons and our staff and our volunteers as safe as possible. So again, this Prairie Stories event is happening on Saturday, September 11th at our museum uh, at Lake of the Woods Forest Preserve located in Muhammad, Illinois, here in East Central Illinois. And the program will take place on Saturday, September 11th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, the Museum of the Grand Prairie and Homer Lake Interpretive Center are open to the public. Uh, we're open from 1 to 5 p.m. Tuesdays through Saturdays at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, uh, and so is the Homer Lake Interpretive Center open from 1 to 5 p.m. Tuesdays through Saturdays. So if you're local, um, get out and visit these awesome free educational facilities to learn about local history as well as our natural world around us over at the Homer Lake Interpretive Center. Um, uh, for more info about these programs and everything else happening at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and Champaign County Forest Preserve District, uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or visit museumofthegrandprairie.org or ccfpd.org. Again, let us know where you're watching from tonight. 
Uh, we love to hear from you. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, also feel free to jot those in the comment section. Uh, uh, my mom's tuning in from Rantoul. Hey, mom. And uh, David's tuning in all the way from Fairfax, Virginia, as well as another David is tuning in from Athens, Illinois. Uh, so welcome. Thank you all so much for uh, joining us for tonight's program. And I also want to thank uh, our, our presenter for tonight, uh, uh, Barb. I'm going to bring Barb on. And uh, Barb, you there? Can you hear me? I am here. <laughs> okay. My camera for some reason isn't working, but my voice is. <laughs> That's totally fine. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, so Barb um, is is going to present tonight's program, and I'm I'm pleased to introduce her for that. And we thank her so much uh, for presenting this program for us tonight. Uh, uh, so Barb Olshiger Garvey is the director of the Museum and Education Department at the Champaign County Forest Reserve District. And this includes overseeing operations of the district's educational facilities, um, which include, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the Museum of the Grand Prairie at Lake of the Woods Forest Reserve um, in Muhammad, which focuses on local cultural and natural history, of course, and the Homer Lake Interpretive Center at Homer Lake Forest Reserve um, in Homer, which focuses on the natural world in Champaign County and environmental education. She also oversees uh, the staff at both of those facilities uh, and programming and education and interpretation that uh, goes on throughout Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Uh, prior to becoming director of the department, Barb served as curator at the museum for 12 years. She received her bachelor's in anthropology and art history from Indiana University in Bloomington and has a PhD in art history from the University of Illinois. Uh, Barb is originally from Cincinnati, Ohio and is a big fan of baseball, especially the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is very appropriate for tonight's program. And uh, her other her other passions include local Abe Lincoln related history and spending time with her beautiful family. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Barb. Let's give Barb a warm virtual welcome, all of us tuning in out there. So thank you so much, Barb. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um... So yes, I am a I am a huge Cincinnati Reds fan, but you will if you tuned in to hear about uh, may, the major leagues tonight, you will be disappointed because this is about local baseball, um, and local baseball um, has so many facets and so many people involved that I'm sure that I will have missed thousands and thousands of points. So what um, I would like to do is start out with a quote. Um, I'm speaking to you from my house on Elm Street in Champaign and right around the corner from me on Hill Street in Champaign, George Will, who is a national columnist, um, um, a fairly conservative columnist, um, but also somebody who's written a couple of books about his passion for baseball. He grew up on Hill Street around the corner from me. And um, in one of his books, he say he, he talks about growing up in central Illinois and baseball in the same sentence. He says, in central Illinois in the 1950s, when the world and I were young, the air was saturated with baseball. With, that is, the broadcasts of the Cubs and the White Sox and the Cardinals and the Browns. And the unreasonably black and most almost perfectly flat topsoil of central Illinois then as now was wonderfully configured for smooth infields and lush green outfields one after another towards the horizon. So in George Will's world, central Illinois is the perfect place for baseball. And it certainly um, has it, a baseball history almost as old as baseball itself. Um, it was wildly popular in um, Champaign County and surrounding counties, it, even as early as the 1850s. Um, and of course, is still popular today. Um, lots and lots of um, little league teams. Um, we called it Not Hole in Cincinnati. Um, and I think there are two, there are too many reasons to mention why it's, it's popular, but, um, one of them, of course, is, as it's been referred to as our national game. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. 
Um, it uh, it holds some communities together. Um, the most common type of team in the late 19th and early 20th century was what called a town team. And towns like um, Buckley, Illinois, have had baseball teams since the 1880s that have been continuously running. Um, there are several, then there was a, several attempts at minor league teams throughout the area. Um, Danville, Decatur, and Bloomington all had minor league teams, and I'll talk about that. Um, we also, I'll also talk a little bit about the University of Illinois and its baseball history, although very briefly. There, um, uh, and, and something I've always loved about baseball is that Baseball doesn't really require a particular body type to play. And so um, eventually it becomes available for everybody to play. Um, uh, all ethnicities, all races, all, even lots of women have played baseball. Um, and um, particularly true in East Central Illinois. Um, and I, I started out with this photograph of this African-American team um, from Champaign. That's about all we know about it, but the photograph appears to be from the 1920s. We, we know some by the late 30s that there are organized um, African-American teams in Champaign County. But this proves that it's even that that happens even earlier and this is not a pickup team this is a this is a team that has wool uniforms that has matching belts and caps and socks and even pretty nice cleats so um everybody was pouring their resources into into playing baseball in um in central illinois now let's let's step back a little bit um this is abner doubleday um, who is credited with um, inventing baseball, but he's not the inventor of baseball. Doubleday fired the first shot at Fort Sumter in the Civil War, and he played a pivotal role at Gettysburg. But, and of course, you, if you were creating a baseball myth, you would want Abner Doubleday to be the guy who invented baseball, but in fact, he didn't. Um, I always thought, think it's like kind of like saying General MacArthur invented the Frisbee. Um, it's something you would want to happen, but it didn't. Um, the first notice we have of base, the word baseball is in the 1770s. Uh, this is a little moral book of morals um, called uh, The Pretty Little Pocket Book, this, this illustration on the left. Um, and we see three uh fellows with tri-corner hats little colonial lads running from base to base which seem to be kind of pillars right this is probably not the baseball that we know but it may be a precursor there are several of them this and a, a game called rounders um and possibly also cricket um but um by 18 57, which is what this this uh, this article from the Bloomington Pantograph is from. By that time, we have uh, baseball being talked about in the local in a relatively local newspaper. Um, and if you look at the center of this article, it says cricket is a very fine game and we do not wonder that a large number of our citizens should be as fond of it here as they were in the land of their birth. But to our mind, it is hardly equal in the way of excitement to our national game. So in 1857, in Bloomington, Illinois, not in New York City or Washington, D.C. or any place with a large population, right? In Bloomington, Illinois, we're, we're talking about baseball as our national game. Um, and that's because it brought people together. Men at the bottom, you can see it says, men of all nations have a liking for the games which they played in their boyhood. 
And no matter how liberal they may be in their opinions generally, they are very apt to believe that their national sports are a trifle in advance of all others. So this is a unifying game, baseball. Um, uh, so what was that early game like? Well, it was played on a big open field like this. Um, note that the fans are just basically standing on the sidelines. Um, there's no protection for anybody. Um, <laughs> the fans were at, at the time were called cranks. Um, they, um, the batman, batsman usually used just a plain stick. Um, no one is wearing a glove. In those early days, no one wore a glove. You could catch the ball on one bounce and it was still an out. The first, at, at first, the, the first team to score 21 runs or aces was called the winner. But in 1857, they changed that to the nine innings, thank God, because I can't imagine how long it would take to have 21 runs. Maybe a little bit less time if you uh, could catch the ball on one bounce. And in 1858, the umpire who you see here standing on the field just to the uh, right of the center of the picture. The umpire got to call strikes for the first time because before that you could just stand there and wait for a pitch forever and ever. Um, this, uh, this is a notice from the um, Champagne newspaper from April of 1867, where we have the organization of the baseball club. Um, the Prairie Club of Champagne was being formed um, by uh, Mr. Van Horn and Mr. Scroggs and Mr. Waxwell um, and, and Mr. Guy. Uh, Scroggs is on the, on the right, upper right here. Um, and he was, uh, a um, newspaper man, a newspaper editor, but he was also a colonel in the Civil War in a regiment that was, was from Champaign. Um, and the notion here, I think, is that, um, and this happened quite frequently, is that um, baseball was promoted by the army during the Civil War to basically keep men from getting in trouble when they weren't in battle. So when they had idle time, they were one of the activities that was promoted was for them to play baseball. And when they came back, then they wanted to continue to play baseball. And so George Scroggs was one of the guys who formed a baseball club in, in Champaign and the guy who formed a baseball club in Danville is the fellow on the bottom left and his name is uh, William Black and he was a brevet general in the Civil War with a Danville regiment and um, a congressman later in life and he's actually related to the the representative Black from Danville now um, but the, he also formed a baseball club back at home and of course baseball was was all over the national imagination at that time. Um, this is a cartoon about um, that was put out in November of 1860. Uh, the popular lithographers Courier and Ives depicted the results of the of the presidential election. Um, but John Bell. Uh, the Northern Democrat, Stephen Douglas, the Southern Democrat, John Breckinridge, and and Republican Abraham Lincoln are all depicted as baseball players. And who has the giantest bats? <laughs> and that would be our old friend Abe Lincoln. And his bat says equal rights and free territories. Um, so, uh, the, and of course, the title is National Game, Three Outs and One Run. So the three outs are the people who lost. And the, the, the um, one run is, of course, Abe, who also is holding the baseball. 
Um, so I said there were town teams. Town teams were um, quite are, are, were quite popular in the late 19th and early 20th century. And these are the Buckley Stars. Now today the Buckley team is called the Dutch Masters. Um, but in 1886, this team was formed. Um, they were all, had all, they were all the rage. I want you to notice that um, they have, a couple of people have gloves. Gloves start to come in uh, in probably the 1880s, 1890s. And um, you can tell who the pitcher is in this picture because he has the 19th century version of a warm-up jacket. It's called a sweater. <laughs> Everybody else is just wearing their plain old wool uniform, but the pitcher is wearing, um, wearing a sweater. Um, and he's also the fellow who holds the ball. The first person who gets a glove is um, the catcher which makes some sense if you're burning a ball down to the catcher from the pitcher. Um, and the second one is usually the pitcher. And then after that, um, the basemen start to get, to get gloves. Um, the, the name of the Buckley team today is the Dutch masters, which is um, a reference to their um, German heritage. Um, there are also, it was also a team, this is from about 1905. Uh, this team is uh, a town team from Muhammad. Um, and you can see that, again, we have a pitcher in his sweater and a catcher with a glove and one other fellow with, a couple of other fellows with gloves, but the rest don't have them. And oftentimes in these pictures, there's also a mascot. The mascots are, at that point, children. Um, and then written onto the photograph are, are the words ump and manager. No, that was not on their, on their um, uniforms, but actually written on to the photograph later. Now, these town teams produce a lot of major leaguers. Um, of course, remember the major league was a lot different in those days, but, um, one of them that the one I'm probably the most fond of is, um, a fellow whose name is big Jeff Pfeffer on the, on the left here. These are, these are all, uh, trading cards. We, we are accustomed to having baseball cards be in, um, a package with bubble gum. I don't know if they still come that way, but they did when I'm even when my children were kids. Um, but <laughs> these were in packages of cigarettes or packages of tobacco. So not exactly the healthiest thing, but you know, that was what sold frequently. And, and these cards were in there. Big Jeff Pfeffer's last name, first name was not Jeff at all. I think they just called him that because it rhymed. Uh, he was um, a pitcher and an outfielder. He played on an early University of Illinois team. He went on to play for the Chicago Cubs in 1910 and 1915, 1905 and 1910. Um, and then he, 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 were, he played for the Boston Bean Eaters from 1906 to 1909. And he had a... Um, ERA of about 3.4. Clark Griffith in the, in the center there, um, he grew up in Bloomington. He was a pitcher from 1891 to 1914, and he was the player manager for the Reds when this card was made. Um, but uh, he uh, went on to own this, the Washington Senators from 1920 to 1955. And he was a fierce opponent of night games. And then on the far right is Al Myers, who was a second baseman from Danville. And he played for the Kansas City Cowboys and the Philadelphia Quakers. I just love these, these names that you just, we don't even know that, that 
how many major league teams there were. Um, and the Washington Nationals, his uh, not an, a, a seriously impressive guy, but um, I loved the I loved the picture where he seems to magically be keep being keeping a, a baseball suspended in midair. Um, a couple of other people. Earl Hamilton was from Gibson City. Um, he played for the St. Louis Browns and the Pittsburgh Pirates and was a pitcher. He pitched 16 shutout inning, innings on, a, on July 16th, 1920 with the Pirates before losing 7 to nothing against the New York Giants, clearly running out of steam in the 17th inning. Rube Benton, the person he was pitching against, also pitched for 16 sh shutout innings. So those guys didn't have too many relief pitchers, apparently. Um, and then the, the last one that I wanted to talk about was, was um, here, this is from, a, you can see this is from a cigar um, package, was uh, Charles, or they called him Old Hoss Radborn. Um, he was a starting pitcher for the Providence Grays and the Boston Bean Eaters. And he, he had a 310 games won in 10 years as a pitcher. Um, he is widely, uh, known as the person who was first photographed flipping his middle finger in a photograph. Um, and um, he, he has been ranked as the 45th best pitcher of all time, believe it or not. He was a cranky old guy. Here he is with this team on the upper, upper right um, of the photograph with the, with the mustache. Um, so baseball was really at the heart of every every town there were um a series of minor leagues um and some semi-professional leagues one of the semi-professional teams that we had in champagne was called the velvets and um this is a picture from opening day in downtown champagne in 1912 um and there was an article in the News Gazette, or I guess it was the Champagne Gazette at the time, um, where, and I just love this, the Gazette's happy and loyal family of workers is going to join the rest of the population, population in celebration of the opening of the Illinois-Missouri League season at League Park next Monday. The last form will be sent from the composing to the press room as soon as after one o'clock as possible. So they're getting let off work to go to the baseball game. Um, and that was actually not that unusual. A little side story. When I was a child, if you could produce a ticket to opening game, you could get an excused absence to go to see the Reds at the opening game. So baseball is, uh, was supported by the local community in lots of ways. Um, this sort of excitement led to the formation of the three I league, which operated for the better part of 60 years, mostly in the I states, Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa. Um, this photograph is from uh, Bloomington. Bloomington, Illinois had a team from 1902 to 1939. Uh, it was, they were sometimes called the, the Bloomington Cardinals, sometimes called the Bloomington Bloomers. Um, and their most, uh, some of their most, one of their most famous players was a fellow named Here's the Bloomington Bloomers again later. Um, was a fellow named Burley Grimes, who was well known for being the last person to throw a spitball. Spitballs were outlawed in 1920. Um, 
but uh, he was everybody who was throwing a spitball in 1920 was allowed to keep throwing spitballs. And so he actually threw his last spitball in 1934. Um, I also wanted to show you this, uh, this photograph of the Bloomington Bloomers um, to just show you how the styles of um, uniforms has changed because in the early days we had the pillbox hats, but now there's a, there's a much closer fitting cap. Um, and these, this is a year that, um, the bloomers experimented with silk uniforms. Um, uniforms are, are were com almost completely always made of wool. And then they started to do wool cotton blends in the thirties, but before that it was all wool. Um, they started to do polyester blends in the 60s and, or synthetic blends in the 60s. And by the 80s, um, uniforms had almost completely gone to, um, to polyester blends. But it wasn't until 2007 that the wool cap finally became a thing of the past in Major League Baseball, and it, it had obviously gone earlier from from these local teams. Um, Decatur also had uh, a minor league baseball team. Their minor league baseball team was called the Commies. <laughs> it was short for Commodores. Commodore Stephen Decatur was a naval officer in the Revolutionary War, and that's where the name Decatur comes from. Um, and, uh, they had a, this team for 64 seasons running from 1900 to 1974 with some years left out. Um, they were in three different minor leagues and, um, they have, they were affiliated mostly with the, with the, um, St. Louis Cardinals, but sometimes with the Giants and other teams. Um, at first they played. They were owned by and played at Staley Field, and you can see the the Staley buildings in the background, which eventually became Archer Daniel Midland. Um, and of course, Staley also owned the um, Chicago Bears when before they were the Chicago Bears, they were the Staley Bears. Um, the Commies played also at Fans Field. This is a picture from Fans Field um, by 1930. And um, they had the first night game in Illinois, they claim, on May 14th of 1930. The first night game, incidentally, in the major leagues was in 1935 at Crossley Field in Cincinnati, believe it or not. <laughs> and my mom and my great aunt were there. Um, Danville also had a series of teams, the speakers, the veterans, the, uh, Dan's, the Dodgers, the Warriors and the Suns. And today they actually have a, a, um, Central Illinois Collegiate Wooden Bat League, um, team playing in, in Danville every summer and still called the Dan's. Um, this picture is from from 1923, the first pitch of opening day in 1923 for the Danville veterans. Um, the speakers was the first, was one of the first teams. Um, and they were, that team was named after Joe Cannon, who was the speaker of the House of Representatives, the National House of Representatives. Joe Cannon was um, quite the character um, he was a tough, tough guy and, um, he didn't, he, he didn't mince words about anybody, but he, he fought hard for Danville and, um, was able to secure the national cemetery for, um, and the, and the, and the VA, um, hospital for, um, for Danville. And so they were, they were, um, grateful to him. 
and named the team the speakers for a while and then the veterans um, in honor of those two things. The fellow in the middle of this picture is uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, the recently appointed first um, commissioner of baseball. And he was commissioner of baseball for a very long time and is widely credited as the fellow who kind of developed the um, restrictions on free agency that were didn't get gotten rid of until very recently. Um, so they were proud to have him there that day on opening day in 1923. Um, another fascinating thing about Danville's minor league history is that um, in 1946, they managed to woo the Brooklyn Dodgers to have a minor league team there. Um, and they built a, a beautiful wooden stadium a year after World War II was over. And that farm team actually tried to recruit Roy Campanella and Don Newcomb, both black players, but um, but the but the the Brooklyn Dodgers were not quite ready to to go that far. Um, but then in 1947, they did recruit Jackie Robinson. He was called up, and um, in June 20th of that of 1947, in this brand new beautiful stadium in Danville, um, there was an exhibition game at which um, Jackie Robinson played. This is a this is a program from the first season. The official scorecard costs ten cents. Now, if you go to the Danville Dan's game, they'll give you a scorecard. But who keeps score? What I do. <laughs> um, this is a picture, a promotional picture from the early days of the of the Danville Dan's, uh, the Danville Dodgers games. Um, these are some player uh, families. And if you look closely, you can see the, the wooden um, benches and those many of those bunches are still in that stadium and you can, you can have, it's one of the few wooden stadiums still left in the country. Um, I would highly encourage you to visit there sometime. Um, there it is being constructed and it looks a lot like that today. There's a lot of stuff built up around it. Um, but it's a beautiful thing to, to go to. And here is the Danville Dodgers from 1948. Uh, probably the most uh, well-known of all of these people is Paul Shervenko, this fellow in the center. He played two seasons with the Dodgers and his manager at the time was Burley Grimes, the guy I told you about who threw the spitball. Um, he retired in Danville and was still playing in the Manor League in 1948. Um, the evolution of town teams into um, minor, minor league teams also evolved into what we know as the Eastern Illinois, uh, Eastern Illinois Baseball or EI, the EI League. Uh, the EI League was founded in 1935 by Shelby Himes, Jack Waldron, and Doc Levitti. Um And there were lots of local local teams that for that first year. The teams were fielded by the tiniest of towns: <laughs> Leverett, Royal, Flatville, Buckley, Sidoris, Thomasboro, Seymour a Chanute team, an Urbana team, and Rankin. St. Joe, Champaign, and Monticello asked to join, but they decided they only wanted to have 10 teams. And in 2015, there were eight teams in the Eastern Illinois League. There are, it is still going strong. Um, so this is a team early from the early days from Royal. And and then on the on the bottom there are early time early days team from Flatville. Um, uh, I, I loved this quote from a, um, a book about EI baseball 
Basically, EI Baseball is a small town summer Sunday afternoon baseball. Fans are primarily small town and country people who have spent most of the summer Sunday afternoons of their lives going to such games, rooting for the home team and razzing the visitors, jeering the umpires, taking time out every now and then to get another beer, either from the car or from the concession stand, maybe grabbing some barbecued beef or a fish sandwich at the same time, hobbing with long time, hobnobbing with long time friends, reminiscing. I think that's that sums up my experience of going to EI League games as well. Um, and here is a, another photograph of the, the Buckley team. Um, this one is from the 1937 Dutch masters. And I love this, um, this sign, uh, as you enter Buckley, welcome to Buckley, a good place to live home of the Dutch masters. Cause that's what makes it a good place to live. Right. Um, and uh, you, one of the probably more locally um, well-known players on the Royal team is here on the left, and that's Lauren Tate, um, who wrote for the News Gazette for many, many years about baseball and many other things. Um, the Flatville team, um, in the 50s, the Flatville team and um, some of the other teams brought in celebrities to bring attention to the games. Um, this one is uh, Dizzy Dean, who played for the, the Cardinals, the Cubs, and the St. Louis Browns, but was really quite well known as a pitcher. Um, and uh, he, um, he came to, to, to the Flatville. <laughs> To, to give a boost to the Flatville Flats. That's the name of the team. And um, they, they clearly presented him with the jersey to fit his size. I just never realized how gigantic Dizzy Dean was. I think he would be scary. To... <laughs> um, in, um, the, in 1961, uh, or, or in 60, uh, Satchel Page came to visit the, um, the Royal Giants, so the Royal Illinois team, um, and uh, he's posing here with Tom Fletcher, who actually pitched for uh, a game for the Detroit Tigers. His um, son, Darren Fletcher, had a fairly successful um, major league career. Um, the EI League also had um, uh, some a champagne team at some point and and, and obviously an Urbana team. Um, um, and one of the people who played uh, in the in the EI League in the on the champagne team was Vern Lewis, um, who also played um, Vern Lewis lo loved baseball, and he um, he actually quit high school to um, to try to join the Chicago American Giants. And his had a contract, and his father would refuse to sign it. Um, but Vern then went on to play for Leroy Barnes's Red Sox, and he and they played in the Corn Belt League, and Vern actually also was on, um, I think it's the Flatville team um, for one year. Um, so there was, um, there was a good bit of recruiting from team to team uh, and from town to town. Um, my favorite story about Vern Lewis is that even in his um, later years, he loved baseball so much he could be found watching it on more than one TV at a time. Who's done that? Not me. <laughs> um, the Champaign Eagles was an Eastern Illinois League team in 1952, and they won uh, league titles in 57 and 66. And Wardell Jackson was the person who kind of was the 
mastermind behind the Eagles for a while. And, um, he had, he did, he was known to recruit several white players throughout the, um, even though the, the, the team was predominantly African-American. So, uh, I love this, the fact that the, that there was integration in the team. It's not a lot, but some, and, and I, and I, to me, it's, it's because baseball was more important than anything else. Um, and, and fielding a good team, right? Um, oh, I had another picture of three generations of Vern Lewis's family in baseball uniforms. Um, I would be remiss if not mention if if not mentioning Ernie Westfield, who um, played for the Birmingham Black Barons, uh, which was a Negro League team. The Negro League started in the 1920s. Um, it was an uh, alternate for, I mean, because blacks were banned from baseball um, uh, in that in that period, and. Um, even though in 1946, Jackie Robinson became the first African-American to play baseball on a major league team, it didn't mean it was like an open door for everyone. And so the Negro Leagues lasted um, into the 1960s and um, Ernie Westfield played for several years, starting in 1959 on the Birmingham Black Barons. Um, and he lived uh, the rest of his life in Champaign. He just passed away this past summer and um, spent a lot of time raising money for young people to be able to play baseball. Um, what about ladies? Well, ladies, we have our newspaper articles from Champaign and Urbana newspapers about women playing pickup games, even in the 1860s and 1870s. Um, and this, Courier and Ives print is from that era as well. Um, women, uh, the first women's baseball team that was paid to be, that they charged people to watch um, was in 1875 and that was in Springfield, Illinois. So um, there were plenty of women playing baseball even before, um, softball was was promoted as a women's sport Soft, softball was actually um invented in uh um, by um i can't remember with it it was an ivy league school and ivy league school for young men who wanted to play baseball during the winter and so they made a softer ball so they could play inside um there were African-American women's teams as well. Um, the Dolly Vardens were, are shown up here in the top left. Uh, they played in the late 1880s and they were a novelty team, not a competition team, but um, I clearly liked, everybody liked baseball. Um, in the 1920s and 1930s are sometimes called uh, the rogue years for women's baseball because occasionally women would be able to sign um, a contract with a minor league team. Um, and now nobody really stopped it. Um, this is, I love this. This is, a, um, this is a piece of sheet music that we actually have at the museum um, from the 1890s. And and the the theme of the of the, of the song is who would doubt that I'm a man um, if she could catch a ball as well as anybody can, um, which of course it's and it's dedicated to the new woman. So a um, couple of people to note: these are not people from Central Illinois, but I I thought they were worthy of note. Um, Jackie Mitchell. In April 1931, she uh, she played for the Chattanooga Lookouts, and she struck out Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig in on an in an exhibition game. Um, and this woman, Edith Houghton, on the bottom right, 
is uh, was the first woman to serve as a Major League Baseball scout in 1946. And then that kind of leads us up to Dottie Schroeder. Dottie Schroeder uh, it was played for the um, All-American Professional Girls Baseball League. And if you've seen the movie The League of Their Own, you know what I'm talking about. But there was a women's um, baseball league um, started up during World War II and uh, ran for um, nine seasons. Um, and Dottie Schroeder from Sedoris, Illinois, um, so in Champaign County, she went for one year to Sedoris High School, but at age 15, she left to play for the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. She made it onto the uh, cover of um, Parade magazine in the in the in the late 1940s um, as a as a as the you know the model for for young girls playing baseball. Um, she was the only one. Oh, excuse me, I said nine, but she was the only uh, only player to play all 12 seasons of the of the. Uh, professional girls baseball league um she was an all-star three times she spent four more years touring it with international teams so she's all all told she played 16 seasons um she holds the records for the most games played in the in the professional girls baseball league and the most at bats at 4129 the most rbis the most walks the second most hits and the third most home runs. Of course, part of that is because she played so long. Um, and I read one place where they said she was she was played second base, and she they said she was defensively impenetrable. Um, some folks think that uh, Dottie Schroeder is the model for Dina Davis's character in A League of Their Own. Dottie Schroeder, um, after her her career, came back to Champaign. Lived in Champaign, worked the rest of her life in at collegiate cap and down, and and died relatively young and at 68 um, in the 1990s. Um, and my favorite story about this is that I I asked to use this parade picture um, from the All American Girls Professional Baseball League organization because they're still an organization. And the person who wrote back to me said, yes, of course you can use Dottie's picture. And we all knew Dottie and loved her. <laughs> so not only was she a great baseball player, but she was kind of a nice person too. So what about the University of Illinois? Well, I mean, I could probably spend three or four hours just talking about any one of these topics, but just I'm just going to touch on a few things at the University of Illinois. Uh, this is George Huff. George Huff was the head baseball coach of the University of Illinois baseball teams from 1896 to 1919. He had 317 wins and 97 losses and four ties. Uh, they won 12 conference championships and they never finished uh, lower than second. I Anybody who would have that record would be welcome today, right? Um he was the athletic director at U of I from 1901 to 1935. And he also coached the football team for five years while he was coaching the baseball team. Um, and in 1907, he was also the manager of the Boston Americans. Uh, uh, he And you may know Huff Hall uh, on the University of Illinois cam campus. It was named after him. And there he is with his team in 1904 on the upper left. Um, one of his players was Carl Lundgren, um, shown here, uh, who played um, eight seasons uh, for the Cubs after playing for University of Illinois and then went on to coach Mi Michigan baseball from 1924 to 1931, and then became the uh, baseball coach and 
assistant athletic director under Huff. And probably the most famous uh, baseball player from the University of Illinois was Lou Boudreau, who played for the Cleveland Indians from 1938 to 1952. Um, he also played basketball and um, he, uh, He was disqualified because, and, and, and in light of the recent NCAA um, rulings on these things, it, it makes me kind of sad. He made an agreement with the Cleveland Indians to play with them after leaving the University of Illinois, but then he was then they disqualified him for even making the agreement. Um, so his senior year, he actually played professional basketball, but he did finish at the University of Illinois. He, um, in 1948, he was a player and also a manager. He had a 355 battering average with 18 home runs and 106 RBIs, and he won the American League MVP. Um, some other major league players from the U of I, Matt Herges, who played, was a pitcher for the Dodgers, the Phillies, the Expos, the Blue Jays. Uh, Darren Fletcher, who played in Royal and then went on to um, play for the Dodgers, the Phillies, Montreal, and Toronto. And Scott Geralts, who, uh, th this is from left to right, um, who, who was a San Francisco Giants pitcher. So... What have I missed? Well, I've probably missed uh, Little League and I've missed American Legion baseball and I've missed the scores and scores of people who played softball and um, I, there are just so many individuals to talk about. Um, it's hard to, to cover it all. American Legion baseball was founded in 1925 as a way to occupy the time of 13 to 19 year old boys who were getting themselves in trouble. And the Little League was founded in 1939 for kids ages four to 16. In 1974, they let young girls play. Um, I'm not sure that it, they actually are that many girls playing still, but, and of course there are all kinds of other uh, leagues now, traveling leagues and so forth. Um, but I wanted to close with this cute little picture of George Will from his uh, later years and, and uh, of early years and um, another quote from him um, because I just, I, I, I love it. He says, baseball being the difficult game it is, even the best hitters in the big leads fail about 65% of the time. One reason for the breadth of the game's appeal is that we are all failed players. I did in Little League in Champaign, Illinois, where I was the model of mediocrity under pressure. One more thing. Um, when we go to a ball game, whether we go to see the Danville Dans or whether we go to see the um, a, a major league team in the seventh inning, seventh inning stretch, we... Um, pick it up and sing, take me out to the ball game. And I just wanted, because I, I think that it, um, if one likes baseball and lots of people don't, um, but if one does, uh, it, it speaks to all of us. Um, the song was written in 1908. Um, and it goes, take me out to the ball game. I don't care if I never come back. The subject of the song was, was a girl, Katie Casey. And she was so addicted to baseball, she begged her boyfriend to take her out to the ball game. And um, she, she lost herself in the ball game. And I think that's why we love baseball. Um, and in many ways, baseball created opportunities that were, didn't exist in the rest of life. Um, and it's, it's a slow 
measured game that you can play in hot weather. And um, I think that's why it persists. And what I like about it is that it has so many statistics that it requires you to remember them. And that that's what makes a historian. And um, it also is what makes memories. And uh, we all like to live with our memories. So I am more than happy to take any questions. Can't see anybody, but I'll be happy to, to, to talk. Pat, if you have any any questions hanging out there. Sure, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Barb. Um, uh, I, uh, I was gonna ask you, um, I think I think you touched on it um, a little bit there uh, at the end and then in other parts of the presentation, but um, what, uh, what, what motivated you to, to research local baseball history? And as Barb mentioned, as I put up on the screen here, if you have a question, write it in the comments, and uh, 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 Barb would love to answer them, you know, as as best as we can. But yeah, Barb, what's uh, you know, we uh, we have this program tonight, and then at the museum we have a whole exhibit with a lot of this content on local baseball history. But what made you dive really deep into it? Um, of course, you have an interest, and um, you know, like the game yourself. But anything else that you haven't mentioned that motivated you so much to, to want to research local baseball history? Well, I wouldn't say that I'm a lover of sports. I'm, I don't, you know, I don't, I mean, and, and, and I, and I thought about that. I thought about people who might be watching tonight and thinking, why in the heck is an old woman telling me about baseball? <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, baseball appeals to me for, I think a lot of the reasons I was just talking about, um, baseball, if you score a baseball game, you can reconstruct it in much the same way as you reconstruct things when you, when you write, tell a story or you write a history. In fact, the, um, the, um, the historian Doris Kearns Goodwin has written a book called, uh, better, I think it's better luck next year or wait till next year, maybe. Um, and it's about her, her learning to write history. Well, her love of the Brooklyn Dodgers, um, <clears throat> until the Brooklyn Dodgers leave Brooklyn. Um, but also, um, her, uh, learning to, to keep score, write statistics, and then reconstruct the games for her father the next day little realizing that there were articles in the newspaper every day about about what was happening i think that 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 appeals to me but um i do think you know it is a game that you can play in the summer months um without getting too overheated because you're not running around a whole bunch just some you know <laughs> And it can be played outdoors. And I also love the fact that it's slow, that you can have a conversation while you're watching a baseball game, that you can talk about strategy and um, and what you think might happen. And um, I like that too. But also it, it's a hometown loyalty. If you grew up in Cincinnati, you better like the Reds. <laughs> so. And I came of age right when uh, the Big Red Machine was winning um, World Series and so forth. So that's yeah, part of it too. Yeah, I was. Um, I I was going to say too. I, I like the slow, measured, you know, aspect of the game, and 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 much like, you know, that that aspect of it, and many other aspects. I, I like the you know, just the relations to life in general, you know, like you said, you're outdoors, you can be outside and spending time with other people and camaraderie either on yeah. the, uh, uh, camaraderie either on the teams or in the stands with the other fans or, you know, showing your fandom, um, you know, with your favorite team and wearing their favorite gear. There's just, there's just a lot to like about it for sure. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, 
Uh, Nancy uh, said she attended a couple of Commodore games in the 70s at Fans Field, saw Gary Matthews hit a homer with a Giants affiliate team. Uh, then. So that's pretty cool. She saw a Commodore. That's game. really cool. Yeah. 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 That's um, great. Yeah. And, and if you have any more questions, you know, feel free to write those down in the comments. We'd love to love to answer those. Um, Barb, I had a question too um, from me. Uh, how did you how did you complete your research? Where did you find your sources? Who did you talk to uh, here in the community? Because you, you know you you showed quite a few awesome resources. You know whether it's photos or or articles. Um, but uh, how did you how did you go about the research process? If you wouldn't mind sharing that. No, that's that's fine. Um, I spent a good bit of time in the Champaign County Historical Archives. Um, I went to the University of Illinois Archives. Uh, I went to the um, um, McLean County Historical Museum, which also has its own archives. The McLean County archives are there as well. And there's there was a fellow there who was really steeped in baseball history. He helped a lot. Um, his name was Bill Kemp. Um, and I, I um, t talked to Jeannie Cook in... Um, uh, um, Danville, who is the person who um, coordinates the Danville Dan's team now. Um, she has a lot of memorabilia from the early days of the Danville Dodgers. Um, and I, um, I did talk to Lauren Tate. Um, I talked... <laughs> I talked to some people on the but on the Buckley Dutch Masters. I actually went to a Buckley Des Dutch Masters game because you know you have to do research. <laughs> that's the best. That's the best research there. You know, right. that's what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I actually talked to a couple of people who were collectors because our original originally we did this exhibit in two thousand seven, and we had um, some really old uniforms and old equipment and so forth to accompany the panels that, that are in the museum right now, but now it's just the panels. Um, and then we actually traveled the exhibit to Decatur and Danville, which is part of the reason that I cast the net rather broader than I might have if it was just about Champaign County. I wanted to mention um, that there is an exhibit opening next Thursday, the 2nd of September, at the um, African, the Springfield and Central Illinois African American Museum in Springfield um, on the Negro Leagues. Um, and it's borrowed from Kansas City. So with, with a local component um, being put together by Katherine Harris. So um, I, I wanted to be sure that people are aware of that because I think that's going to be a great exhibit and I'm hoping to go see it myself, but um, uh, baseball brings them all out, right? Um, uh, I talked to the woman today who runs that museum and she was telling me that they have a short, um, a short movie that features Ernie Westfield um, who played for uh, the Birmingham Black Barons and actually uh, it was put together by WILL um, and also talks about Bobo Smalls. I'm not sure precisely where he was from this area though and he played for the Indianapolis Clowns which was another um, uh, African-American baseball team or black um baseball team i'm trying to so anyway i want i wanted to make sure that that uh that i mentioned that so that people could have the opportunity to go see it yeah that sounds like a pretty cool exhibit there yeah yeah, I, yeah. I, and it's the springfield and central Illinois african-american history museum correct? yep okay. yep okay i have to check that out that sounds pretty interesting maybe yeah. maybe we can make a uh a work field trip out of that there you go <laughs> any any excuse right yeah yeah. No, you, nobody should be fooled. We don't do that. <laughs> we would like to do it. We always talk about it, but we never follow through. 
Yeah. Um, well, um, I'm not seeing any questions coming through, Barb, but okay. um, if there are questions, you know, after the fact, feel free to write those in the comment section and we can come back to them later. But thank you so much, Barb. Um, yeah. uh, even though we can't see you, uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Um, and I learned a lot. You know, I, I played baseball growing up, played it in high school, played it, you know, in the summers as well. And uh, you know, has a special place in my heart. I know it has a special place in yours and, and, you know, folks watching out there too. There's a lot of um, emotion tied into the game of baseball and a lot of passion and it's, it's a great game and it's, 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 it's great to learn about the historical aspect of it as well as the local historical aspect um, right. uh, here in central Illinois. Um, so thanks again, Barb. Thanks everybody for watching. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, um, I just dropped a, a, a link in the comment section. Uh, would really love to hear from you all, get your feedback on tonight's program. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind clicking on that link and taking that short survey, it shouldn't take more than five-ish minutes of your time. Uh, let us know what you thought about tonight's program and uh, what other sorts of programs you'd be interested in the Museum of the Grand Prairie or the Champaign County Forest Preserve District offering in the future. We'd love to hear from you. Um, any final words, Barb, before we close out tonight? No, just thanks a lot for coming. Thanks a lot and keep keep following us. We're going to have some great uh, Lincoln lectures later in the fall and, and have a lecture about um, uh, about the East Frisians of Illinois. You know what Flatville, Royal, Gifford, all those places had Eastern Illinois League teams and they're also East Frisians. So we'll have more great information to come. Oh yeah, yeah. It's thanks uh, a lot. Is it the fifteenth annual Lincoln Lecture Series this year now? It's fourteenth. Fourteenth, fourteenth. So fourteenth yeah. annual Lincoln Lecture Series and more rich history there uh, in the East Frisian community of, of Champaign County in the northeastern section. So yeah, right. stay tuned. Um, uh, thank you, Barb. Thanks everybody again for watching, and until next time, we'll see everybody. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Join us.